fortunate to have with us Peter Winston, Executive Vice President of Cinemed and Administrator for EHS Medical Group. And please join me in welcoming Peter. Thank you. So, just as point of introduction to uh, those of you who I don't know and here today, uh, my apologies in advance. For those of you I do know, you'll come along for the ride. This presentation is really to show the evolution of Medi-Cal. We're talking about all of these crazy changes that are coming as a result of healthcare reform. But the bottom line is, these changes really haven't stopped. I've been in this industry since 1994. Oh my God. And the bottom line is, Medi-Cal managed care has always been in a state of flux. It has never been sitting straight forward. I'll also describe how the expansion of Medi-Cal under the Affordable Care Act, while increasing the number of insurers, is not necessarily going to impact access in a negative manner. In fact, I would argue that it may actually strengthen. And finally, as government programs continue to expand, we'll show how EHS is addressing a number of these challenges and continues to evolve. So first, let's talk about some of the perceptions about Medi-Cal. I mean, Medi-Cal has always been different. 30 cents in the dollar, a lot of doctors don't want to take Medi-Cal. It is ignored by mainstream medicine. How does an office see 100 patients a day, right? The, the definition of a Medicaid meal. Well, it was real simple. Mom would come in with her four kids. They wouldn't leave anybody in the waiting room. You'd come into the exam room, the doctor would go, hola, 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 hola. And you would have five claims that would be generated to the state. That's how Medi-Cal was viewed in the past. There are other perceptions. I've heard them, you've heard them. They smell, they're non-compliant, they're filling up my waiting room and pushing my insured patients out. And then you have the provider community. If you can't make it in commercial and Medicare, we don't want you. You're not the kind of doctor that we want. Foreign trained, foreign born, and so that was a significant problem. For those of you who have not been in this arena for 20, 30 years, just a brief history of how Medi-Cal has changed. Medi-Cal managed care started about 20 years after the advent of Medi-Cal itself in the mid-60s as part of Johnson's Great Society. 1985, state of California embarked on a project called Primary Care Case Management, PCCM. And in California, the model actually was a shared risk. The state of California, the HCS now, would contract with clinics, give them a capitated payment for a basket of services, what we know as professional services on, on the Division of Financial Responsibility, and then we go on a shared risk basis with the state. There were 13 of these PCCMs back in the mid-1980s. Uh, it was before my time, but the company that I then started to work for was one of those original 13. I know that there's a couple of other of those original PCCMs here in the audience today. There are other versions of PCCMs across the country. North Carolina is probably one that is uh, talked about the most. Uh, their model is they pay Medicaid fee for service at 100%, and then they pay a $3 per member per month case management fee. Uh, the question is, how do you define what you're doing for that case management fee? That's always been a problem. And most recently, there's a little bit of an uproar back there in North Carolina about whether or not they're actually saving the amount of money that's been reported. What I like to say is by the early 1990s, the PCCM program was so successful that the Department of Healthcare Services decided to do away with it. At the same time, HMOs were involved in the PCCM program. They were called prepaid health plans. You couldn't call an HMO what it was an HMO. We had different names. 
for the different lines of business. So prepaid health plans were there also. They were also very successful. They were also terminated in the mid-1990s. In fact, some of the plans that were in business then did Medicaid, I'm going to it now. Blue Shield was used to be a big Medicaid player back in the early 90s. So was Pacific Care. But when we started making changes to the system, they opted out. In its place, we had a new paradigm. We created this managed care system for Medicaid patients. It's a, it's a little bit of a, of a spumoni here. We have three flavors that we would be working with. One is the county organized health system, which we had the, uh, the San Mateo plan here. Basically, single plan takes over the whole county. Down here in Southern California, the equivalent is Cal Optima. You had the geographic managed care plans. You had a couple of counties. Basically, I called this the any willing uh, provider plan or the any willing health plan counties. If you met the criteria, you were able to contract for Medicaid. Sacramento is one of those. San Diego is another one. And then you had the two plan model. And in this particular mix, you had a private plan that is one of the commercial HMOs would bid and take over. And then you would also have something called a local initiative, a public-private partnership, if you will, with many stakeholders. And basically, those two plans would divide up the county. Here in Los Angeles, you heard John Wallace talk about it. LA was a bit of a different animal because LA was so big that it was impossible to divide up the county into just two. So they did, then went with the plan partner model where you had different affiliations, strategic alliances, and so you have LA Care with its plan partners, which includes Anthem Blue Cross, Care First, Kaiser, and then you have HealthNet, which includes Molina as its plan partners in order to divide up the county. You also have, uh, in San Bernardino Riverside, you had another flavor of this two-plan model, Polyglot, where Actually, it's just the opposite. HealthNet is on top, Molina is underneath in Los Angeles, and the Inland Empire, Molina is on top, and HealthNet is, on, is underneath. And in reality, this was the low hanging fruit. I mean, we talk about pregnant moms, healthy children needing immunizations. Basically, if you got into this business, if you didn't do well, there was something wrong with you. Because it really, there was not that much pathology in the population. There was pathology. It was there. Okay? But really, it was more of a on-the-job training program, if you will. We learned by dealing with this population. Where the provider groups were concerned, it was a mixed bag. Some counties adopted a delegated model early, Los Angeles County. A lot of the groups were contracted directly with the plan partners. They had their delegated models. Many others were based on direct contracts between plans and providers. However, over time, what we've seen is more and more counties shifting to the delegated model. For example, Anthem Blue Cross, who I know is what we're representing here today, started out as a direct contract model throughout the state. But around 2006, then, tackled it differently and started to contract with delegated medical groups. The reason for this is, is, is really quite simple. Physicians figured out how to work the system. So if you were a direct contract on fee for service, you put all your sick patients there. And you put all your healthy patients under capitation. That's what it was. So what Blue Cross did is said, no, we're going to take away that perverse incentive and we're going to go delegated model throughout. And so now then what ended up happening is everybody was playing under the same rules of engagement. And you saw that in more and more places throughout the state. In some cases, the IPAs were locally grown. In other counties, they were invited in or asked to create something. And so over the last 10 years or so, EHS as it has expanded throughout the state. In some cases, we grew it. In other cases, we were asked to come in and create something that would address the needs of that community. 
And as you all well know, these communities are different. You need to respond locally. Typically, O'Neill said all politics is local. The same things with Medicaid and any kind of healthcare politics, it's all local. Most recently, we added the mandatory conversion of the seniors and persons with disability programs. Basically, close to 400,000 statewide within our medical group, we added 16,000 of these folks. The good news is, over time, the more experience we had with the population, we were prepared to deal with the additional pathology that was coming in with this group. Now, I say we're prepared. We were as prepared as we were going to be. That doesn't mean that we weren't surprised by a whole heck of a lot that was going on out there. Tremendous pathology that was going on. You want to deal with the 80-20 rule? And we got that 20%. So we learned very quickly what additional things we needed to do in order to be able to take care of this population. The good news is this is where the HMOs actually recognized that they needed to start looking at stratifying some of the risk with their delegated groups. And so we were able to negotiate with the health plans that actually receive more money to take care of these sicker patients. But one of the problems that we have is what I want to call cherry pick. And that is, in the early days, with that a lot of pathology, everybody's going to make money. When the going gets tough, people start to to self-select, they start to leave. Or they'll say, I only want certain types of patients. So you've got IPAs that you're contracted with that are pediatric IPAs, why? The pathology isn't that hot, and they make a lot of money doing that. We don't believe in that. Basically, if we're gonna be in Medicaid managed care, we're gonna take everything that comes with it, the good and the bad, and we're gonna learn from that and apply those lessons system-wide. Everybody's focusing on 2014. The bottom line is the change is now. 2013 is a major year of transformation in Medi-Cal managed care. First up, I talked about it with the first speaker this morning, is the transition of the S-CHIP population, healthy families, into Medi-Cal. We've got 860,000 children that are being moved from one to the other. Good news is it takes away the co-pays from the patients, but they will still have to write their checks to the state in order to be able to maintain their subsidized health insurance. All of that's fine. But on the Medicaid side, what we've been learning is the amount of money, the premiums that are going to be paid by the state are actually even less than uh, the health plans had been receiving under the Health Families programs from Mr. Mitt. That's a bit of a problem. Because if we don't have adequate funds to take care of the population, then how can we do this? It's not a question of taking from one cohort to subsidize another cohort. Basically, we try to make sure that everybody's able to stand on its own feet. There is less pathology in this population, but I also would argue that some of the reasons for the states thinking that they can save some money on this is due to the lack of encounter data that's being provided to the health plans who in turn provide it to the state. And so that's a challenge I make to all of you because you folks have been lax in bringing the hammers down on your delegated provider groups and not saying you're not giving us the encounters in order to support the capitation rates that we're paying you. If I'm not doing it, I expect to get slapped. And I would expect the health plans to do that with all of the groups, and I don't think it's being done right now. Second major change happening this year is the rural expansion. About 300,000 members in 26 counties throughout California that were not part of the um, managed care transition programs in the 90s and the 2000s are now happening. These are basically the last folks that are going into managed care. There's a lot of activity going on. The RFPs for this population were due on Friday of last week. The state will now be evaluating those applications to see who's prepared. Again, there are different models 
uh, that will be uh, out there. The question is, is it going to be delegated model? Is it going to be uh, direct fee-for-service contracts? We know that up north, um, they're looking for a regional multi-county COS, county organized system. The states pushed back and said, we don't think so. That just means it's going to be a multi-county GMC. So that plan will be there. There will be a second plan. Who that second plan will be, we don't know. You all probably have a better idea than I do. We talked about the duels. Coordinated care issue. 100% of the Medi-Cal is going to go into Medi-Cal managed care. The question is, what happens with the Medicare component? We know what the state wants, we know what the feds want, they want it all coordinated under a single plan. But as we've also heard this morning, the doctors are already coming out with their own communication pieces that says, don't join. So good luck with trying to coordinate that. Well, there are ways, and then I heard John say, we need to do a better job of engaging. Well, one of the engagements I would say is to go to the state and do what you did with the CBAS program. So when adult day health care centers became CBAS, all the doctors were then saying, you have to, this population, the SPDs and the people who use those services needed to go into managed care. First thing the doctors did is tell all their patients to not join and opt out. And then the state turned around and said, and oh, by the way, if you opt out, you lose your CBAS benefits. Guess what? There was a backlash against all of those fee-for-service doctors who were trying to maintain their fee-for-service populations to continue to work those patients. So there are ways of getting more of this population in, I would say, engage the legislature, engage the bureaucracy, and say what benefits do they have now that they would lose if they stay out of the system. If you can create that kind of incentive, then you can get more of those folks to come in. And we can accomplish the things that we want to accomplish with this population. One we haven't talked about, part of healthcare reform and Medicaid, is the raising of professional fees on primary care services. Effective January 1st of this year, 2013, Medi-Cal fee-for-service rates are supposed to be raised from the current Medi-Cal fee schedule to the current Medicare fee schedule. I can tell you, I am already getting phone calls. When are you giving me my money? <laughs> and I tell them, I don't know. It's got to come from the feds to the state, from the state to the plans, from the plans to me, and then we'll talk. Especially if you're a primary care physician who's getting paid on a capitated basis. A prepayment for services that is anticipated to be provided. So one of the questions is, if you were to take your encounter data and come up with an equivalency and compare that to the Medi-Cal fee schedule and to the Medicare fee schedule, are you being over or underpaid as a primary care physician? Interesting discussion is going to go on with our physician community. I hear it all the time. We talk about encounters. So the common argument that I get when I pay a doctor capitation is, you don't pay me for encounters. Of course I do, it's called capitation. It's built in. Oh no, but I gotta pay my data entry person to put those into the billing system to send to you and I don't get any more money for it. Well, I'm happy to lower your capitation and then provide you an incentive to do that. So when they all start coming to me and asking for my Medicare bump, we're going to have some interesting conversations. And while we're talking about raising fees for primary care medicine, primary care services, in the budget is a 10% fee cut for everybody else. How many specialists do you know are going to be willing to take Medicaid patients at 90% of Medicaid? So that's going to be a challenge to a lot of folks. And the governor's budget does still include a lock-in provision, which has already been turned down by CMS once, but that doesn't mean that the, the governor's not going to try again. And 
And then we hit 2014 with two major changes. One is the implementation of the health insurance exchange called Cover California, and the other is the expansion of Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal plans will be asked to join the exchange with plan options with very low or zero premiums for those earning between 138% and 200% of the federal poverty level. But the reality is, especially with living wage families, and we heard it again this morning, when you change your situation, your plan may change as well. You may go from Medi-Cal to the exchange and from the exchange to Medi-Cal and trying to coordinate the care under a moving population is going to be a significant challenge. The exchange is looking for the bridge plans that they're going to be able to offer these folks. And then we have the expansion. Significant. Nationally, we're looking at 8 million new beneficiaries that are going to be added to the roles. In California, as many as two million or more will be added to the roles. Subsidies for this population, as well as for the increase in the, uh, the Medicare bump, for the first three years is paid for by the feds and then 90% thereafter. So California will be responsible for the additional, for the, for the remaining 10%. And I was listening this morning, uh, Kaiser Health uh, News, uh, on the radio, on NPR, they were saying that the cost of California could be as much as $1.2 billion a year in budget shortfalls that the California budget's going to have to make up in order to pay just that 10% for all these new folks. The fallacy, however, is that all of these new patients will swamp the system. The fact is they're already getting care. The question is where? They're getting it in the ER. They're paying cash. Or they're already going to the public clinics. So it's not like they're not getting care. They didn't all come over the border all at once. We didn't swing it open and everybody come across. And that's our new population. They're already here. They're already being treated. Some of it may be delayed care, but they are already in the system. Problems are, you don't know anything about them. And we've heard about all the challenges that we're going to have with this population, being able to absorb them into the existing structures. And everything that you read about is how are the FQHCs, how are the federally qualified health centers, how are the rural health centers, how are these community clinics going to be able to absorb all these patients? The answer is they're not. One example, last month, LA Times talked about the proliferation of medical offices in disadvantaged areas, quote unquote, calling themselves community clinics. And there were concerns about these people using the name. Really? Of course. The article described them as not part of the nonprofit safety net, and they were concerned. Of course, they're not part of that. These are independent physicians in the communities that are already taking care of these patients. The fact is, the public sector is not the only sector taking care of these patients. We continue to remind folks that 70% of the healthcare spend in these communities is done by independent community physicians. The FQs play a part. The clinics play a part. But they are not the bulk of the services that are rendered to this population. And all these new patients coming in are not going to be siphoned just there. Just on a normal distribution, 70% of these new patients are going to be coming to the independent community physician. These are our heroes. They're critical members of the healthcare safety net even though they're disavowed of that designation. What does that mean? They don't have access to grant funding to update their systems. They don't have access to the additional help that nonprofits are able to do. They provide the highest value at the lowest cost. 
They don't get rent payments. They don't get the $150 per office visit. They live on $27 an office visit, which will soon go to $54 an office visit with the Medicare model on a fee-for-service basis. These guys are the key to the expansion. So how do we address this? You do so by giving these traditional providers who are already taking care of this community the additional tools to make it happen. And you do it with technology. So while I am executive vice president of Cinemed, a management company for delegated medical groups and capitated hospitals, we're then reinvesting those dollars in technology to help this community. My commercial and senior brethren are doing it all the time. Awesome. No one's looking out for the Medicaid community, and that's where we focus our efforts. And when I say we're doing it with technology, even if you have to drop hold that, kicking and screaming into the 21st century, these guys are still on paper. And that is one of our biggest challenges. So let's talk about some of the technologies. The first one is called Connect. Everybody's got, this is our web portal. It's nothing special. Everybody's got a web portal. Every, the health plans have web portals, all the medical groups have web portals, everybody's got one of these things. You log in, it's HIPAA compliant, it's secure, you can look up eligibility, you can submit an authorization, you can do those things. What we've done is we're taking this technology and making it a platform for doing a whole lot more than just vanilla web portal work. One of these we call console. This was a, a program that we originally developed with a, a local health plan. And while that health plan went ahead and then focused the technology on the urban <coughs> core, we went ahead because of the footprint that we have on a statewide basis of looking at rural healthcare. And so we would go out and say, doctor in Oakhurst, outside of Yosemite, needs access to a specialist. So where are you going to go? They like to send them to San Francisco, by the way. How about if you don't have to go anywhere, and we have a platform by which you can have access to a specialist, and the secure communications between the primary care and the specialist and we pay both. This is, you know, telemedicine is not a covered benefit a lot of times. There are no fee schedules. We pay because we believe in the technology. We believe in the outcomes that we're doing. It's basically a store and forward program. The referral goes in. If it meets criteria, the referral gets rerouted to the specialist. A secure communication dialogue occurs. If everything is resolved, end the story, everybody gets paid. If it's not resolved, we already have the entire communication history. I don't need to ask the medical records. We already know it was tried. So it auto approves and then the patient is sent to the specialist because we weren't able to deal with it through our console platform. At the end of 2012, we had 15 specialties under this program. We're averaging about 120 of these a month. So we've done about 1,200 so far, and we're continuing to expand the program. It's been very well received. Another, and again, all of this is going through our, our, our web portal. We are beta testing this right now. It's what we call the plan. We're very, as you'll see, we don't go in for uh, going for, for um, Taking the technology and have it patenting our own, we're copywriting our own words, we're very agnostic. So we go for the generic terms. What do you think plan is? It's a place where you actually get to look in. So you will be able to look at our case manager notes. You will be able to check auth status and what's holding things up. You will be able to go in and see what's happening on the in delegated inpatient case management activities that our staff is delegated to provide. Oh, when it comes to audits, 
Your people never need to leave the office again. I'm sure they're not happy about that. <laughs> We're currently in beta testing right now, and it's going to be uh, fully released to all of the plans and all of you, probably in the second half of the year as we continue to speak. We have other works in progress. A member port, right? We talked about it. But how are we going to get these people enrolled? Oh, yeah, they're going to go on the internet. So let's talk about Medicaid patients. How many have access to the internet? High speed access? How many of them are, are able to contact their doctors? How many of them have different addresses from week to week? We all know the challenges within this population, but there is one thing we did find. A lot of these folks have one of these. This is the communication vehicle, even for the Medicaid population. So, who's collecting email addresses of your beneficiaries? I got one, and you're a doctor group, you don't count. How many plans are collecting email addresses and then sharing that information with your medical groups? There's a challenge for you, because if you're talking about engagement with patients, then you need to go where they are. And if they're all online, how are you going to get to them? Especially if they move. We know they'll have a cell phone, we know they'll have an email address, and you can't communicate via normal email, so now you've got to go through your secure communication protocols in order to get there. A caregiver portal. Heard some talk about long-term supports. These are people working in the patient's homes. How about giving them an act, a place to actually chart? Because they're not doing anything right now other than receiving a check for doing what? The money's going to be a pass-through, okay? We talk about the long-term supports. We know that IHSS workers are part of the program. What are you doing to integrate them? So we're working to create those communication vehicles. They're not all going to do it. But hell, if I got 20% of them to actually put notes into the system, what kind of information will I have access to for these patients that are having significant issues that they actually qualify for a worker in the home? Hospital portals, right? You got lots of stuff going on in the hospitals. How are they communicating? We want to create communication vehicles. Again, we're doing telephonic. We've got nurses visiting the hospitals. What if they can just put the information in? What if we can integrate their EMR system so that the information comes back to the case managers? And the hospital list who's doing the rounds, who's the primary care in the hospital? or an ER portal. This one I love. So, you guys have a risk management issue because this is a population that goes to the ER quite often. How many of you are taking your data and scrubbing it to look at some of the problems that are out there? I got a patient in a two-horse town seen 22 times in the ER in an 18-month period of time, complaining every single time of pain, abdominal pain, and every single ER doc is ordering a CT scan. Now, it's one thing for Cedars-Sinai to go out there and say, oops, we calibrated the machine wall. But it's another when every ER, every ER visit is resulting in x-ray exposure. What are you doing about talking to the ER physicians and your hospital contracts about over-radiating your beneficiaries, your members? So we're creating these things. We've had conversations with the hospitals. They keep shrugging their shoulders. I'm waiting for the lawsuit. And then also SNFs. If you're going to deal in long-term supports, you're going to need to deal with the SNFs as well.
The issue with medicine today is there's a consolidation going on. Doctors will join medical groups, they'll join Kaiser, they'll put more just a permanente. They'll join these things because of the regular hours, they don't have to deal with the overhead. But the bottom line is, a lot of the doctors that we talk to, especially those that take care of the Medicaid population, are still working to figure out if they want to be a group or if they want to stay independent. So we're creating a group purchasing organization so that they can make that independent decision for themselves, the reason why they went to medical school in the beginning. So what are they going to do? They're going to go ahead and they're going to say, okay, I want to get contracts, so I'll join an IPA, preferably EHS. Um, I need to get an office location, so I'll connect you with a realtor with discounted rates on commissions. And then what about insurance? I'll get a, a MedMal program in place for you. So we'll be doing lots of stuff. HEDIS, P for P, Medicare Five Star, really doesn't exist in the Medicaid environment. So we're taking that and bring it to the individual physicians and rewarding them for actually doing the same things that all the commercial and senior doctors do. Including, for those that qualify, free EMRs. <coughs> Some groups will go out and pay for EMRs for their docs, but usually their staff models. For the independent docs, who's gonna go into the poor communities and actually buy an EMR for somebody? We love that. And then we have some of our development activities. We call it Cinemed Labs. We're doing lots of funky things. We talked earlier about the duels, about how we're going to take care of these super sick patients. Well, we've actually done something about that. We've actually created a clinic, a hot spotting clinic. We call it the Downtown Coordinated Care Center. We took one of our medical groups in downtown Los Angeles. We took a hospital that's capitated, so there was we now have aligned incentives. We spent a couple of million dollars on a clinic, and now we're focusing on the 1%. We haven't talked about that. We're talking about how we keep people in the right place at the right time, but we also know that there was you know, that one patient that's going to cost you just a ton of money. What do you do about that? So we've done it. We created the DC3, down at the Court of Care Center, and we have about 75 patients that we've already identified. The sickest of the sick, the 1%, not Romney's 1%, our 1%. And we're focusing on taking care of their needs. Whatever they need, they get. For example, first patient in the door, morbidly obese, diabetic, amputee, lives on the second story apartment. The only way she got out of her apartment was by calling the fire department for them to you know, carry her down the stairs. Bring her into the clinic, We'll run a full diagnostic, undiagnosed breast CA. Stage four. Done. But had nobody done anything, this patient would have ended up in the ER, would have been admitted, and probably had a three to four month stay for the rest of the life. Palliative care is not a covered benefit. We gave it. Hospice is not a Medi Cal covered benefit. We gave it. You give the patient what they need. I'll ask you all right now, second story. So, how many plans in this room will allow medical marijuana as a covered benefit? You're not a plan, stop it. <laughs> Why not? If it's medically necessary, if it'll take care of that patient, why wouldn't you? You got failure to thrive, they can't keep food down, why wouldn't you want to give them a good case of the munchies? <laughs> right? Is it helping the patient? Yes. So why wouldn't you do that? We give the patient what they need, even if it's not a covered benefit, because in the long run we all make money. I don't know what the CPT code is for a joint. Someone's going to need, going to, need to share that. And speaking of sharing, we did bring in one of the pot clinics into our office. I can tell you it was very well attended by staff. <laughs> Life Center. We have a joint venture in Sacramento. We're opening up our own birthing centers. Why would you do something like that? Well, if you think about it, 
Medi-Cal patients, they're all going into the hospital two or three days. I know how hard it is to negotiate with a hospital. I know you know how hard it is to negotiate with a hospital. So why don't more people use birthing centers? Because they're run by nurse wives and they're not accepted by the OBGYN community. So what do we do? We made the OBGYN's partners. And we do a joint venture. And the midwives will still run it with oversight by the medical community. What happens? Well, in about two or three years, I think there may be some differences and some dish funding for a few facilities if we're able to do what we expect to do. But we are talking about bringing the cost down by being innovative and coming up with different types of solutions. So the first one's opening up in April in Sacramento, and we're on the lookout for some other places. Healthcare reform, we're actually putting out our own website coming up with information, because information is key. So we're going out, we're reaching out to the doctors, having them sign up, and as we start blogging, and as we start coming up with more information, you know, that's what we're focusing on. I think I skipped one, I did. And then the health information exchange. And I know I gotta wrap it up. Uh, so the health information exchange. Interesting thing happened. We're in San Bernardino, Riverside, we hook up with the Inland Empire Health Information Exchange. And a funny thing happened on the way to San Bernardino and Riverside. They said, oh, by the way, you're in eight different counties, aren't you? Yeah. That makes you statewide. So we now potentially have the backbone of a statewide exchange. We're agnostic. We're going to be reaching out to all of the other exchanges. We're going to be building the analytics to go along with it. You know that, that little radiation boy? I want the ERs to be able to pop in and be able to see where these patients are anywhere in the state. Now, I have an admission. The problem that I have is that when we talk about population health, the definition of population health is you treat all populations because there's constant transitioning going on in that population. But we're still cherry picking. We got a group that says, I want this cohort, I don't want a different cohort. The negative perceptions of Medicaid continue to persist. I was in an HMO meeting with a bunch of provider groups, and, they, and one group stood up and said, I want to participate in the duels, I don't want any of that Medicaid crap. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not just California, guys. I saw one, an article, a press release in New Jersey. Major multi-facility medical group stands up with their health plan partners and talk about this great accountable care something that they're putting together. They're all shaking each other's hands. They're going to be in all products except Medicaid. Really? The good news is that as long as those biases persist, that's going to create opportunities for guys like us. Okay, 60 million years ago, dinosaurs roamed the earth. An asteroid fell a little bigger than the one in Russia. What happened? The little creatures that landed ended up becoming the dominant species of the planet. That's happening again. We will continue to work with these disadvantaged populations. It's a lot easier for me to go from 100% of Medi-Cal to 120% of Medi-Cal than it is for the commercial senior groups to go from 100% of Medicare to 60% of Medicare. So I know I'm going to be working with you guys a lot more. So if you're already contracted with the HS Medical Group, thank you. And if you're not, why not?